Association is uh, co-organized uh, with Forum, a uh, student association from EM Lyon, uh, whose role is to organize a number of uh, conferences with uh, political people, uh, scientists, uh, artists, entrepreneurs. And this opportunity has been made possible by a very good and old friend, uh, Sean Henry Bessadero. Thank you, Sean Henry. Uh, we've been working for four years together. Uh, Sean Henry comes from HC Paris. Uh, he has been uh, leading a number of uh, major operations in the domain of uh, human relation, and he was the one who made this uh, opportunity possible. So many thanks, uh, Sean Henry, for this opportunity. Uh, this is a very special time for us to, to welcome uh, Vinit. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, and to listen to your experience, uh, your wisdom, uh, much of it being carved in India. And as you may know by now, uh, India will occupy a very special place at EM Lyon. Tomorrow morning we have a, a, a conference at uh, uh, Paris from 9.30 to 11, and we'll be revealing a number of uh, strategic features from the next strategic plan of EM Lyon, EM Lyon 2023. And one part of it uh, is uh, our next uh, settlement, so development of a campus in India, uh, with a very prestigious partner, uh, the Xavier Group, where uh, you were partly educated. Uh, so I see it as a very special signal, as a sign, where planets are aligned. Uh, so again, uh, thank you for coming, and I would like first to invite Elsa, right? Uh, Leah, sorry, Leah, <laughs> I don't know you all, uh, to give a short introduction about uh, Vinit. Vinit Nayar, welcome. Our student association would like to thank you for coming here at OM Lyon. Born in a town of Himalaya, you started with mechanical engineering studies before studying management at the Xavier School of Management in India. Your career started in 1985 when joining HCL Technologies, an IT company based in India. Few years later, in 2005, you are promoted president of HCL with the responsibility of restructuring the company. You did not only restructure it, you transformed it. The turnover jumped from less than a billion in 2005 to almost a 5 billion global technology services company with over 85,000 employees across 32 countries. This outstanding performance makes HCL one of the world's most influential companies. In 2007, you were named CEO and remained at disposition for a six-year period, six years that you used to make HCL become the best employer in Asia. Something remarkable, especially in a country like India, where the work market is strained, which allows some companies to take more liberties regarding the workers' rights. Without compromising growth, you successfully launched disruptive and innovative in initiatives. Your unique way of thinking is recognized by the entire profession as one of the world's most modern management. Fortune magazine will even describe your techniques as an all-star leadership that could dominate in any industry. After many other titles and awards, you decided in 2010 to theorize all these ideas and techniques in a book called Employees First, Customer Second, Turning Convention and Management Upside Down. You use your experience to explain how one small idea can initiate a revolution. Your idea was simple. It was to put employees first and customers second. But just as a single matchstick can start a fire, you started a revolution at HCL Technologies by changing the traditional hierarchy model and making employees the priority number one of the management. Chapter by chapter, you recount how you implemented this employee first philosophy, notably creating a culture of trust by pushing the envelope of transparency in communication on information sharing. Additionally, you unlock the potential of employees by fostering an entrepreneurial mindset. You believed that we could go from an elitist leadership to an altogether leadership, and you were right. HCL tripled its revenue in less than four years. In one sentence, you plainly created one of the most democratic companies in the world. But you didn't stop here. 
You are part of Forbes magazine, 48 Heroes of Philanthropy list in 2016. Indeed, you are trying to make things change with the Sam Park Foundation you created with your wife, Anna Puna Nayar, in 2004. The goal is to improve learning outcomes of 7 million children studying in government school in India through frugal innovation ideas. Basically, your plan is to fight every problem that India is currently struggling with. Inequality between men and women, lack of education, and the pollution in one of the most polluted countries in the world. But where many people are just giving beautiful speeches without acting, you decided to follow the Acta Non Verba motto. You are an inspiration for young people, and we are honored to receive you today. So once again, thank you for coming, and I hope it will inspire students here tonight to turn their ambition into achievements. Good evening. So the question is, how do I inspire you? <laughs> Transform is a word which stands for changing the form of something permanently. Transform. The most important part of the word transform is permanently. And second most important is change the form. So if you want to transform your lives, then two things you have to decide for yourself. You want to change permanently and you want to change. This is a story of an ant and a butterfly. An ant is an ant. It can be a rich ant, a fat ant, a fast ant, a French ant, or an Indian ant. But an ant is an ant. But if an ant wants to be a butterfly, then the first thing it has to do is to stop wanting to be an ant. Inspiration is about believing that you were born to do something else other than being an ant. I'd like to share today my life story with you. And in this journey, hopefully, inspire some of you to think about your life differently than the way you are thinking. My success is that when you walk out of this room, you walk out of this room with a decision to do something dramatically different than what you did a year ago or an hour ago. The first story I remember of my life <clears throat> is my father and my family were transferred from this small town in Maharashtra to this beautiful hill town right on the foothills of Himalayas. We were on a train ride. <clears throat> it was midnight and the station on which the train stopped was Ratlam. And I'm talking about a story of 1970, when I was eight years old. And when the train stopped, I was one of these kids uh, who was always interested in what's happening outside rather than inside. Inside the train are boring. Uh, the, you know, the concept of air conditioning didn't exist at that particular time. It was a hot summer, and therefore it was very hot uh, inside. So while my parents were sleeping and my two brothers were sleeping, I stepped out of the train and started looking at this beautiful place called the train station. Indian train stations are really, really very enchanting because there is so much activity and so much diversity in activity which is going on. So I was enchanted by that, and I did not see that the train had started moving away from the platform. And when I did recognize that the train has started moving away from the platform, the first thought which came to my mind is, that's fine, let me take a few seconds more to enjoy the scene before I get back to the boring train. That's called overconfidence. <laughs> the train started moving a little faster. I said, fine. 
So I walked a little fast, caught hold of the handle of the train, pushed myself up and fell. Till that time, I had not learned the physics of the fact that you cannot, you know, as a young person, you don't have so much strength in your arm to pull yourself up. And if the train is moving and you are also moving, there is very little your feet can help you push you up. Fear is what stepped into my mind. I had a choice to make. Freeze or run. I decided to run. I ran after the train, caught hold of the handle again, pushed myself up, fell again. Panic. I had a choice again. Cry or run. I decided to run again. Caught hold of the handle, tried to get up, fell again. Doubt. Now, I had an option of giving up, sitting on the station crying, waiting for help, or getting up and running. Now it was very clear in my head that getting on the, on the station or getting on the train was an impossibility. It was very clear in my head that I had missed the train, because now the train was running faster than I was. I couldn't run as fast as the train was running. I decided to run. Those days there were no mobile phones. So therefore, if I missed the train, I missed my parents. I think they would have celebrated when they had gone home. <laughs> I started running again. From nowhere, this vegetable vendor lady who was sending vegetables on the station saw this entire scene unfold in front of her eyes ran, caught hold of my knickers, and threw me in the last compartment, which was the guard's compartment. And then slowly and sheepishly, I walked and got reunited with my parents. The lesson that incident taught me is that life is full about trains you don't belong on. But how will you get on them unless you run an illogical race? If you don't change trains, which are impossible, if you don't change, chase trains, which logically you should not be chasing, how will anybody have a chance of throwing you off on the train? From that day onwards, I have been running behind trains, which I should not be running and trying to catch. And that is the day Vineet, as an ant, learned how to be a butterfly. Fast forward, within a few years from that moment, my father died. In India, that's a difficult one, predominantly because female members of the family are not the earning members. And therefore, life for the family changed overnight. There was less than $10 in the bank, we were three brothers and my mother. Typically, after the death of a, of a family member, the family goes and lives with the parents of the father or parents of the mother. Or it's, you know, it gets united into a different family. For the first time, I saw my mother set three rules in the family. Number one, we will stay put. One. Two, we will not take anybody's help. Three, all of us will grow up. You must remember, we were, you know, in early teens. So I was 14 at that particular time. And I understood what it means to take responsibility of your life. She enrolled herself at the age of 40, into school. And she did her master's in English, and did her PhD, and started teaching in school. And that became an example. 
that it is never too late in life to do something meaningful. But it is very important not to blame the circumstances, but to take control. In our house, we never talked about how our family was disadvantaged. And all three of us became very successful in our chosen field. My younger brother is a very senior member of government in India. My elder brother is a very serious and very big, famous businessman. And I am here. <laughs> and that's a lesson I learned from my mother. The fact that you do not give up at the first sense of adversity. And that lesson became very handy when I joined HCL in 1985. When I joined HCL in 1985, I got a, a job with Levers. And when I got a job with Levers, I didn't somehow feel that I'm a toothpaste salesman. And therefore, I, I did join them, but I joined this small startup company called HCL. It was $4 million in revenue at that time. I joined them. And the promise which they had made to me is the fact that we wanted somebody to transform the company. The company had been in existence for 10 years, and there was nothing happening in the company. I joined the company, and you must remember, given my economic situation, the job was very, very critical for me. This is the first time I would become an earning member. You know, unlike you guys, we, I straight went from engineering to MBA. I wanted to finish my education rather than work. So this is the first job. And I was waiting for the first month check, which was very important for me. And the first month check arrived, but in form of a sacking letter. I was sacked. And the reason I was sacked from HCL is because they found a fitment problem. And they said that, A, you don't understand technology, B, your attitudes are all wrong, and we as a company cannot afford a person like you because you will bring our reputation down. So that time, I went and cried in the night and said, God is unfair if he exists, and if I had a gun, I'll shoot him. <laughs> and then I said, the three people who called me in the room and sacked me, I said, if I had a gun, I'll shoot them. <laughs> and then by the morning of crying, I came to three decisions. Number one, that is the last time I will allow my life to be owned by anybody, in, you know, anybody. Number two, one day I'll become the CEO of HCL and fire these three people. And number three was a more personal statement that I will not cry on these stupid issues. So the rest is history. I did become the CEO of HCL. After that story, something interesting happened. The startup bug hit me and said, I need to do startups. Remember, I'm still economically weak. And I went to my mother and said, hey, mom, I want to do a startup. And she says, what does that mean? I said, what it means is for a few years, there will be no money. She says, we are used to it. What next? <laughs> I said, it means that I will take a risk with my career. And after that, nobody, nobody, nobody may hire you. He says, we are used to it. What next? And she asked me the most important question at that time. She says, Vineet, when you are dying, would you regret not doing it this time? I said, yes. He says, then don't think, do. So I started my own company called Comnet, which is Communication and Network. It grew to a $2 billion company. By the time I was coming to the end of my entrepreneur journey, I was increasingly getting convinced that the whole chase of profits is not what I wanted to do. And therefore, I set up some foundation. But remember, there was an instance which I talked to you about in the past of my sacking. God smiled on me and in 2005 said, dear boy, do you want to lead the company? 
and the three gentlemen were still working in that company. <laughs> so the chairman of HCL called me and said, Vineet, would you want to leave the company? Initially, I said no, because I, a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm not a straight thinker. I'm a disruptive thinker. I like excitement in life. I don't like straight lines. I mean, I don't know why anybody creates straight lines. I don't understand why people create rulers, right, that straight line. I mean, it's so dull, so boring. Why would anybody draw a straight line ever in life when you can draw it in so many interesting ways? Never is the journey from point A to point B a straight line. But anyway, I got this opportunity, and I said no. And then he said something, which is the chairman of this company, said something very interesting. He says, Vineet, do you really want to make a difference in the lives of people? Why don't you start with these employees? If you, if you bring about a change in their life, that is the journey you wanted. You have all the resources in the world. You can make a difference. Why don't you start here? And that's the reason I started HCL. I mean, HCL's transformation. And the whole employee first, customer second idea was born out of that idea in terms of, I was really frustrated with the existence of employees. I truly believe that in the end, in the industrial age, it was important to manage resources, and therefore managers were important. The job of managers was to get more out of less, and therefore all the knowledge, what you study in B school, MBA finance, and marketing, and all this stuff is about managing resources and getting more out of it. But with the digital aid, innovation became more important. And the only way innovation would succeed is you get more per unit of human capital. And if you want to get more per unit of human capital, you have to stop being a manager, you have to start being a leader. You have to stop counting value, you have to start creating value. And unless you know how to create value, unless you know how to inspire people, you can't be a leader. Nobody needs manager anymore. Whatever you have learned in B-School, I can tell you, is bullshit. It's going to not help you in life at all. You have wasted how many ever years you have wasted. <laughs> Unless you have experimented with those ideas in your rooms, in your life, in your class, and unless you have redefined the boundaries of logic and reason. And that is very critical for you to understand that the ability of creating and learning how to be a leader is the single most important aspect of leadership. Because in the end, you alone will do very little. You with the team can do a lot more. If you manage team, you will get 10. But if you lead a team, you will get 1,000. And therefore, ability to inspire teams, ability to get more per unit time of human capital is the biggest thing you need to learn. And that's what Employee First, Customer Second was all about. Can we inspire 100,000 employees to produce with the same product, the same, price, the same proposition, the same markets, much, much more? We moved from market cap of $1.4 billion to $20 billion in market cap with no change in product, no change in pricing, no change in proposition, and no change in markets. All what you learned in MBA school, none of that but only by one thing, by energizing, enthusing, encouraging, enabling people to believe in themselves. And therefore, my appraisal was done by these people, and the results were published on, on the web to see. And you can read a lot more about it in the book, or we will talk a little later about how Employee First, Customer Second Journey was there. But by the time I was turning 50, it was very clear in my head that chasing profits and measuring life and pursuit of life in terms of recognition, in terms of financial goals was not what I was meant or was born for. I needed to run behind a different train. I needed a new train to run after. And we came, I came across these, these 144 million children studying in government schools in India. And these 144 million children studying in 760,000 government schools in India, various reports had come out and said 80% of them in grade 5 can't divide and multiply. 
50% of them in grade five can't count, can't construct simple sentences in their local language. The India you know and the India I know are very different India. So if 144 million people are unemployable, forget about unemployed, the country is a disaster in making. The second question I ask myself is, how much pursuit of profit and wealth is enough we need? Where will this end? What is the true meaning of life? What is the true meaning of existence? If there are six, seven billion of us in this planet, if we are not going to take care of each other, then what is the difference between us being animals and us being humans? And that is the, decide, that is the year I decided to quit my corporate avatar and work with my wife to try and pursue a dream of transforming a elementary education in India. Every transformation needs two things. Number one, it needs an aspiration of chasing trains which nobody else is chasing because everybody had given up. The government had doubled the expenditure in education over a decade and the learning outcomes had come down. So therefore, there was no correlation between investment and outcomes. So everybody has stopped chasing that dream, and everybody was talking about it, doing very little about it. So the first thing you need of transformation is an aspiration to chase the impossible dreams. The second is you need innovation. So if you travel to India in a remote village, which very few people of you would have done, what you would see is that India is, in the villages, very, very poor. If you get one square meal, that's great. If you get sick, it's it's difficult chance of recovery. But what they do on a Saturday or a Sunday, one of the weekends, is they put bamboos, put a white sheet on the bamboo, and put hire a projector and see a Bollywood movie. And when they see a Bollywood movie, it's an immersive experience. They forget everything else. They forget the leaking roof. They forget the sickness. They forget the hunger. They forget everything, and the whole village comes together. And some sit on this side of the screen. Some sit on that side of the screen. But it is an immersive experience. The question we asked is, can I bring this immersive experience to the classroom? Would that motivate the teachers? Would that motivate the children? Would that solve the problem? The second innovation I saw in villages is that despite no electricity in the villages, there are mobile phones all over. How do they charge it? They charge it with a cycle, dynamo. So I said, okay, if I can have a big battery which can be charged with a cycle and create audio lessons in it, Bollywood style, which is song, dance, music, uh, actress's voice, and create an immersive experience along with teaching learning material, can the teacher who can't speak English teach English? Can a teacher who doesn't understand maths teach maths? And the answer was yes. So only with two-day training and with this boom box, which was called Sampark Tidi, we launched the program. Today the program is impacting 7 million lives in 76,000 schools at less than a dollar per child per annum. And the result of last year, which was done by an independent survey, showed, remember I talked about 80% of grade five children couldn't multiply and divide. 76% of grade two children could do three-digit division and three-digit multiplication and construct 100 sentences with English words they have never ever heard before in their life in just one year. And that was the magic which was created by Sampark Foundation in just about a year and it is spreading like wildfire. There is more demand for a program than, than what we can do. So what I want to share with you is that, you know, there is a story I like to end with, which is my favorite story, and I all end all my speeches with this story because they are, this is so inspiring for me, is when a child is born in India, the, one of the first person to be called on the stage, on the bed, is a grandmother. The grandmother comes and picks the child to bless the child. And in India, it's very auspicious for the grandmother 
to come and bless the child, to be the first other than the mother and the father to bless the child. So everybody waits and the whole family comes together when the grandmother picks up the child and then the grandmother defines the vision for the child. Your fingers are so long and you'll be a, a, a artist, your forehead is so wide and you'll be a NASA scientist or your legs are so tall and you'll be, there's no logic, there's no reason. But the grandmother defines a vision. The entire family believes in that vision and then works very hard to make that vision a reality. As the girl grows up, everybody tells her that this is the vision which Amma had defined for you, and then she starts working very hard to make that vision a reality. And over time, that vision does become a reality. The moral of the story is, in life, visions need not be based on reality, they need to be based on trust. If you believe that something is going to happen, it's going to happen. You don't need logic and reason. You don't need to be trapped in logic and reason to define a vision for yourself, for your organization, for your society, for your school, for your country. You need to believe in it. So when you walk out of the room, the question you need to ask is, what do you believe in? What do you believe in which is illogical? What, is, what do you believe in which is not based on data or facts? And if there is nothing you believe in, which is big, which is aspirational, then inspiration is not going to help you. You were born with a completely different DNA to the seven billion people for a reason. Find the reason and then chase the train you don't belong on. Thank you. Um, th thank you, Benit. That's my, I think, sixth conference since uh, 2011. And again, it's a different story each time, except the last one, <laughs> except the grandmother. You know, you have been, uh, Today, I mean, tonight, you have been very personal. If you compare what you said earlier this morning, uh, it was more a kind of content, and then you, you have been uh, much more uh, emotional to some extent, and you, you start, for instance, I never heard uh, the story about uh, your mother. I have just a simple question. It seems that, you know, everything in life you have done, I've been to some extent facilitated to by someone, you know. Uh, look, your grandmother vision, then your mother experience and uh, you know, and then yeah, the HCL chairman, you gave you the, the opportunity to, to do the, this just amazing story with HCL technology. So wh wh what is the impact of this such a people? And, and uh, you mentioned this morning, uh, obviously you're one of your leader, you're mentioning in the book, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, this kind of, what makes you so kind of, uh, you know, uh, they take the opportunity with the, these people, you, you give you a chance to some extent. So I, I would again use the same, uh, you know, my mother is my biggest management guru. And she said something very interesting to me in life, uh, not me, to all three of us, is uh, uh, be a sponge. Uh, so whenever you said I had a habit, I'm sorry, I have a habit of talking too much when we get together as family. So she was telling me, Vineet, you need to learn to be a sponge. A sponge is somebody who absorbs more and then is ready to give when the time is right. And when the time is right, the sponge gives more than anybody else till that time it is only absorbing. And I think that lesson stuck in my mind. So whenever I meet a young person, I irritate the shit out of them by asking them a lot of questions because I want to learn. So I, I see every interaction as an opportunity to learn, as an opportunity to absorb, and then when the time is right, I squeeze the shit out of myself to make sure that I count in life. So you're absolutely right. All my ideas are borrowed. All my ideas are inspired. I get inspiration for, from so many people I, I work with, I come across, 
and there is nothing original here. <laughs> you want to inject to me? Thank you. All right. So uh, before I we go to your book, I had a, one question. Something that quite fascinates me is that your um, your foundation. Uh, you want to you want to tell us something about the year twenty twenty five? Yeah. Okay. So, so one of the things when we set up Sampark Foundation was uh, that I announced that Sampark Foundation uh, will be dead in twenty twenty five. And that created quite a flutter uh, in India and abroad. Uh, today, Sampark Foundation is a Harvard Business uh, School case study, and I hope one day to start in this school on how frugal innovation is done. But one of the things which, in that case study, it dwells on is why did I say we will shut it down in 2025? And the logic for that was uh, my logic in life that you exist for a purpose. And anything you do in life has to be for a purpose. Foundations are meant to solve problems. So if by 2025 we are able to solve it, there is no reason for our existence. If we are not able to solve it, there is no reason for our existence. So there is no reason for our existence other than the fact that this is a rich man who is trying to search for something to do and give nice talks. That's not me. So therefore, we decided that 2025 will end in 2025, will create a sense of urgency within the foundation and a sense of purpose of solving a problem or attempting to solve a problem using innovation in a certain period of time and dying in that attempt of either solving it or attempt in solving it. Sampar Foundation will not exist beyond 2025. been mentioning basically uh, thank you uh, uh, you have been mentioning the the, the inspiring role of uh, many people uh, that have gone through your experience can you tell me a bit more about how you proceed or how you proceeded uh, to inspire these uh, dozens of thousands of people who are in your company uh, and basically how did these uh, innovative ideas emerge uh, that you captured in your book so was a special uh, uh, turning point, breaking point, or was that a kind of uh, evolving movement and, uh, and so on? Yeah, so, so I, I go back to a childhood story, uh, which is the way your mind is wired, and uh, Charles is right that I'm today talking more personal than I've ever done. Yeah, don't, so. don't know the reason for that. But uh, I used to be this bored young kid, uh, and I invented a game. This is when I'm three years old. So what I would do is I would climb on a table and take a, a glass, you know, a glass glass, uh, and uh, shout for my mom and start counting backwards because that's, that's the time, first time I had learned to count one to five. That's all I knew. So I would count one, two, three, four, five, and on, on five I will drop the glass and break it. And if my mother can come, before five, that the glass will be saved, otherwise it will be broken. Uh, so that is the day my mother named me Vineet. Vineet, you know, is, was, was an antidote. Uh, in India it means polite, you know, I'm not. Uh, it didn't help. But, but in my, my mind was always wired to try and do stuff which is interesting uh, and different. Uh, not be status quo. Uh, I was studying in a Catholic school uh, with Sisters of Notre Dame teaching me, and I had an American uh, principal, and she had a, had a big influence in my life, uh, predominantly because there was nothing which I couldn't do in that school. And I, you know, that principal helped me, inspired me. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, playing marbles uh, in a geography class because the teacher was very boring. Uh, and uh, the teacher threw me out of the class and my American principal threw me out of the school. So I was investigated. Uh, I was thrown out of the class, uh, thrown out of the school and said, don't come to the school again. Uh, so a couple of decisions I took. Number one, I will not tell my parents. 
Number two, I showed up in the school boundary gate and sat there. Uh, from morning to evening, didn't go back. And the principal will come out every day and saying, why are you sitting? I said, I'm sitting on the boundary. I want to be in the school. I'm not inside the school. I'm outside the school. But uh, I will not go home. I did that for 15 days. And, the, and then the principal did something which was very interesting. She called me back. She took me to the assembly. And she says, this boy won't go away. And if all of you have that attitude, you all will be doing something which is quite dramatic. So she did not tell my parents that I was investigated. After 15 days, I was back in the school. And I think there were lots of examples like this where whenever I experimented with doing something different or doing something differently, it worked, which added to your confidence of experimenting it with more. Uh, my, my wife is from the same town as I am. And uh, this is a very interesting story. So I was, she was the most beautiful girl in town. And I was the most handsome boy in town. So I set my eyes and says, I need to get married to you. And she, she said, yes. The only problem was she was in school and I was in school. So the question is, how do we break this news to the parents? So I went to the, to the father. And the father obviously said no. Uh, because my reputation preceded my conversation. And he was a doctor. And he wanted his daughter to be a doctor or whatever it is. And I was a nobody. And he set a couple of rules for me uh, in life in terms of you can't talk to my daughter, you can't do this, you can't do that, all that stuff. So I had, a, I had an agreement with him that for seven years I, I would keep away from his, his daughter. And after seven years, if that was true, and I still wanted to get married, then I'll get married. I got married seven years one day later. So there were a lot of things which were, uh, you know, which worked out from childhood, uh, which helped me experiment and do stuff. And in the end, I've learned in life that all these experiments are not life-death experiences. It's not cancer. Uh, they will not kill you. So if they will not kill you, might as well try them. And if you try them, worst case, they will fail, you'll learn. Best case, they will succeed and you will be successful and you'll be invited to speak in such August gathering. Going back to, to your stories, and if I go back to your talk you gave this morning at the Entreprise du Futur, uh, there is something you said, and I, I'd like you to, to redevelop a bit this idea. When, when you made the change, your employees first, customer second, one of the key issues was to give really a, some power to the employees and to improve the relationship between the, the, the employees and the customers. Because when you say customer second, it's not because they are not important. They are so important that you put the people first because they are. And you say the same thing for the Sam Park Foundation because you say one of the big changes I have tried to implement is to improve the relationship between the prof, the teachers, and the students, and the, the pupils. Can you elaborate a, a bit about this yeah, relationship? So, so, so that's an interesting question. The birth of Employ First idea is based on four questions. Uh, question number one, what is the business of existence of HCL? The business of existence of HCL is to create differentiated value compared to its competition. The more differentiated value and differentiated experiences you create, for your customer, the faster you will grow. Question number two, where does this differentiated value or differentiated experiences get created? The answer is it gets created in the interface of the employee and the customer. That's a value zone. Question number three, who creates this differentiated value or differentiated experience? Answer, employees in that value zone. That's the fourth fundamental question. If the employee is the differentiation or is, if the employee is creating the differentiation, then what should the role of manager and management be? And the logical answer is, it should be nothing but enthusing, encouraging, enabling the employees to create the differentiation. And therefore, management has to be accountable to the employees. Therefore, organization pyramids has to be inverted. Therefore, my appraisal was done by 100,000 employees in 32 countries, and the results were published on the web for everybody to see. 
Therefore, the whole employee first, second, customer second culture was about making management accountable to the employees so that the energy level of the employees will go to such a degree that they will create magic, which is what I said, $1.4 billion of market cap to $20 billion with no new product, no new markets, no new proposition, no new pricing. When we came to Sampark Foundation, we asked the same question, what is the reason for existence of Sampark Foundation to transform learning outcomes? Where are learning outcomes impacted? It gets impacted in the interface of the teacher and the child. That's called the classroom transaction. Who impacts the learning outcome? The teacher. So therefore, what should the business of Sampark Foundation be? To enthuse, encourage, enable the teachers, motivate the teachers, inspire the teachers to create unique experiences for the child so that the learning outcome improves. And therefore, how do we do it? How do we inspire a teacher to teach English when she can't speak English? How do we inspire a teacher to teach maths if she can't understand maths? And that is the time we hit the innovative idea of the fact that it's not that the teacher doesn't want to teach, it's the teacher can't teach. And all people who are attempting teacher training are wrong because you cannot teach a teacher English in a few days of training. It'll take years. And therefore assist her with frugal innovation technology like the audio box so that you inspire the teacher to teach, enable her so that her disadvantage of not understanding the subject becomes the advantage. And guess what? The most important thing, while the audio box is teaching English and phonics and maths, who's learning the most? The teacher. So our target is that in two years' time, the teacher will throw the boom box out of the window and start teaching. So it is not the biggest trans not just the biggest transformation in education impacting seven million million people in seven million children across the world, but it is the biggest teacher training exercise anywhere in the world. And there are hundred thousand teachers in this program, hundred thousand teachers. So in two years time we will have hundred thousand teachers who can teach maths and English like nobody can dream of. And that is the day the transformation will take place. The same idea. If you think employees first, customer second, you think of the people who are solving it, solve their problems, and then they will create magic. And that's something I hope you will inculcate in your management practices. Machines are not answers. People are. Learn the art of motivating and inspiring people and getting more out of people by enabling them and giving them stuff they don't have so that they can do what they want. Everybody wants to do something. They can't do it because there is something they don't have. As a leader, you are in the business of giving them what they don't have, enabling them, inspiring them, enthusing them, and then they will count, climb Mount Everest every day for you. All right. Let Let's get back to some literature then. Um, so in your book, um, Employees First, Customers Second, you describe four major steps. Um, one of them is uh, transparency. Uh, today, we know that only half of private companies regularly inform at least some employees about the organization's financial performance. How did you concretely achieve that goal of transparency within HTL technologies? Remember I was telling you this train story where fear was a very important element one had to overcome. Uh, CEOs are the most afraid group of people. They are scared. They are nervous. Uh, they, they, they dream of fears all their life. Uh, and that's the reason they're not transparent. For some reason, rightly or wrongly, uh, it's like a cheating husband who believes he will not be discovered. It's never happened in life. You always get discovered. And therefore, these people believe that trans lack of transparency, the employees will not know, nobody will know. There is a, uh, there is a very interesting experiment which was done uh, in Africa. Uh, 
in Africa, in a, in a specific tribe, when a child is born, uh, the mother writes a song for the child. And then she sings that song uh, for the child in the womb for nine months. And then when the child is born, the whole family gets together and sings that song. And they did, and, and when the child dies, the family gets together, and you know, when the child dies as an adult, that song is sung for that child. So that song is for the child. Like a name, there is a song. So they did this experiment where the, the mother was away five kilometers or five miles away, uh, and the child was crying, and the mother started singing the song, and the child stopped crying. And they did it many times, and the probability was statistically significant for the, them to conclude that the power of intention is so strong that the child will understand the intention of the mother and keep quiet despite not being able to hear it. I think we don't understand that in management. You know, we, we are too lost in, in all the stupid books we read. Every single employee knows the intention of the management before the management opens his mouth. You need to understand that fact, that your, un your intention is transparent, your words are ignored. And therefore, the concept of transparency is the obvious. The employee already knows. The second thing, from a management point of view, I, I like to tell you another story. There's a plumber who walked into a very rich man's house, and the rich man spent a lot of time explaining to the plunder, plumber how beautiful the house was, how Michelangelo painted a painting, how Gandhi sat there, Nelson Mandela sat there. All that stuff he said for one hour, he went on, kept on talking about how beautiful the house is. At the end of one hour, the plumber asked him, that's fine, but where the hell is the leak? Every single employee who walks into an organization, we don't tell him where the leak is. We keep on telling him how beautiful the company is and how important it is for him to feel very proud of the fact that he is in the August gathering of that company. Once the CEOs understand that the transparency is a recipe of telling people, go fix it. Once he understands that the power of transparency is the ability of galvanizing so many plumbers who will help you fix the leak, the CEO will be transparent. I think there is not enough conversation in France or in anywhere else in the world on what is the positive of transparency. And once they understand that the positive of transparency is to have a lot of plumbers in your organization fixing the leak, I think they will learn to be transparent. And that's what happened in HCL. That's what's happening in all over the world. Organizations which are leveraging transparency are fixing more problems, gaining more, more shareholder value, gaining more market share than others. I heard that you had a, uh, an internet page where people would like rate other people in your, within your income? Right, so we had two things about transparency is the fact that first is you can ask a question to the CEO and everybody will see it and the CEO will respond and that can, question be, can be anything. And uh, to my surprise, uh, I don't know why I was surprised, 99% of the question uh, started with, Vineet, the organization sucks because. And they were all critical of the organization. And you know, for the first, and this is after one year of really putting hard work, I didn't sleep for one year. And I felt very demotivated and dejected that how dare these employees not value the amount of hard work which I put in. And that is the time I discovered the power of transparency. I said, yes, I completely agree with you. And can you let me know what you're going to do about it? And once that became the mantra that we accepted that this is broken, and there was no discussion on the acceptance, suddenly the whole you and I portal converted from questioning the CEO to suggesting the CEO that we need to do this, we need to do this, because now they completely figured out that this guy doesn't have the brains to solve the problems. So we might as well help him solve the problems. And that's how the transparency really, really helped us. So everything which we did, these are small experiments and incursions. Uh, we did it digitally, we did it portal-wise. Uh, we had a unique review culture. So every time I will review my uh, direct subordinates, we will have an open line where any employee of that division can log in 
and the entire review he can hear. Every time a manager will come and make a presentation to me, that manager will put it on a portal where all employees can see and comment on. And therefore, before the presentation is made to me, all employees have already seen the presentation, so the manager can't fly kites. So the transparency experiments, there were many such transparency experiments, and each one, and I call them experiments because they are not management mantras, right? You need to deploy them and employ them for a purpose. And if, as long as the purpose is met, you should do it. If the purpose is not met, you should change it. And I think these experiments of bringing in more transparency energized the organization, and that's how they delivered magic. Uh, in the same line, you have, you have argued uh, in a number of cases about the power of simplicity, architecture of simplicity. And it seems to me that a number of uh, our corporate organizations suffer from uh, embolia or complexity. How do you manage to simplify things? Yeah, I, 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 had a, I had a very simple rule that if you can't communicate something in 30 seconds, don't communicate at all. You know, uh, Again, I, I'm sorry, I go back to my mother because there's so much I've learned from her. Uh, her slap taught me when to shut up. And I think, I wish there was somebody, and all CEOs had a mother who could slap them uh, and tell them when to shut up. We CEOs don't know when to shut up. So we make a very simple idea very complex because we love to talk. And if every CEO was told that you can't talk for more than two minutes, they'll make complex ideas simple. The second mistake we do in simplicity is we forget who we are talking to. For example, today I'm talking to you. There are two aspects to it. Who's talking? Me. To whom? You. So who is more important at this juncture? For CEOs, them, because I'm talking. And there is where they make the mistake. If they figure out that actually I'm talking to you, and therefore I need to see where you are today and where you need to be by the time I finish this conference or finish this conversation, then I'll make it simple. And therefore simplification of idea and communicating simple concepts a step at a time are very critical. Again, I go back to an example because I'm, you know, I'm, I love to quote examples so that you remember them. Otherwise, management mantras you don't remember. So we are in the middle of a desert, all of us in this room. And it's 12 o'clock at noon. The sun is right up. And all of us know that if we walk east, or the CEO knows that if we walk east, we'll be saved. If we walk west, north, or south, all of us will be dead. The only problem is the CEO doesn't know where East is. What does he do? Find out where East is? He can't. Let's assume he can't, which is most of the case. There is no compass. There is no way to know where the East is. So he has a choice. He can lie to his employees this is East and start walking. He can build a consensus amongst employees by having a vote. What should he do? Wait for some time, he loses. Wait for something. Wait for sunset. I'm telling you, in the next one hour, they'll all be dead. If they don't start walking east, they'll be dead. Everybody, so you build a consensus of where East is. So you choose East and say, this is East, and start walking. Right, they can think about, but they can't find East. Let's assume they can't find East. <laughs> yeah, not, there is no way you have no compass. The sun is right up there. How will you discover where East is, right? So what do you do? You pray. You pray, you okay. Pray. <laughs> you pray till you die, yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Sorry? You share the team in four directions, so you kill three-fourths of the team, <laughs> and 25% survive, okay? And then it is a difficult choice in terms of who is going where. So the reason, is, the reason of this example is this is life. This is exactly the life of the CEO. Most CEOs don't know where East is. And what do you know, what do you do when East you don't know? My answer is you tell your employees, I don't know where East is. If we start walking in this direction, our probability of survival increases by 25%. So from 0% survival rate, it'll become 25%. And if we discover that we have take a wrong decision, we will try and double back, but at least we are 25%. Honesty, talk about the first step we are going to take, which is start walking in this direction. Talk about the reason or probability increase. Talk about the risk and talk about the fact there is no choice. Instead of lying to them and saying, you know what, I know where East is because I did that in the past organization, and therefore you need to trust me. Yeah, I will trust you once and I discover you are wrong, and then I'll not trust you again. Therefore, if you take the difficult choice in life, yeah, this is the simplicity of communication. Your mind has to be uncluttered about these things. If your mind is uncluttered about these things, and you adopt simple management mantras of just taking a decision of that one step, not you will die or you will live and what is the purpose of life and blah, blah. Just that one decision. What do you need to do to increase the probability of the current situation from 0 to 25%? Go and take that decision. Communicate that decision. It's simple. People will understand it. People will start walking if they trust you. Otherwise, if you start walking left, they'll start walking right because that's, you know, that's, that's something they, they have you got used to it with you. So that's the simplicity of arguments. That's the simplicity of actions and mantras. Before uh, before we leave uh, the 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 room as questions, I have a last question. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, is you you left as you say you decided to leave this company uh, about five years ago, and uh, question is when we have such a model, you know, it's always dangerous because we have a long a strong leader, and in fact, you know what you describe in the book, what is very interesting is in the fact that you describe you discuss the role of the CEO, you know, in length, and what I call earlier in one session in the, I called it servant leadership, you know, which was you were at the service of, yeah. but the point I want to make is, this company HCL, if I look at the last, uh, you know, I went uh, three days ago on the, on the website to make sure that I was not wrong, I saw still growing, you know, since I wrote the case in 2013, you remember, a new case, uh, I see the company still going up, you know, growing up and so on. So d do you have the feeling that what you have, you know, put in the mindset, collective mindset of this company with the people uh, is really sustainable, you know? And uh, what, what is your feeling? Because it's always interesting to have a management model and to see if the model is kind of, you know, goes beyond the leader and goes beyond the... So, so you're wrong that HCL is not growing after I left. It is growing much faster after I left. <laughs> and, uh, and that gives me joy. Uh, and this question has been asked to me many times, that uh, does it take a leader uh, to transform? The answer is yes, it takes a leader to transform. But the impact of transformation stays if the idea is big. So Nelson Mandela, when he transformed South Africa into independence, it stayed. Today, I don't know how many of you follow cricket, but there is a path-breaking initiative they are taking where the number of people of African origin in the team are going to be a minimum of this number. In, in very competitive sport, they're taking a decision to give representation of people who are from the disadvantaged bracket of South Africa, which in my mind is a path-breaking idea in a globally competitive sport. That's the 
So that's not about independence of South Africa from apartheid, but that's a philosophy Nelson Mandela has left behind of the fact that it is not about winning and losing, but it is about taking all brothers and sisters along. And that philosophy has stayed despite Nelson Mandela not being there. Gandhi's impact on India is identical. His philosophies, India got independence maybe three decades too late, but the fact that everybody does go back to refer to Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence. And the whole philosophy of nonviolence is the reason of our existence with states like Pakistan on one side, China on the other side. You know, so it's, it's, it's a difficult territory to be in. I think Israel is the only other territory which is, which is you know, more difficult. But, but in that difficult territory, without w making violence the big thing and making nonviolence the virtue, we have been able to manage without wars for many, many years. We have a border dispute with China, which has run into 40 years. And other than that one war in 1962, there has been no wars. And we have been able to manage it pure, predominantly by making non-violence the big mantra uh, of our existence. So a lot of philosophies, if they are big ideas, uh, outlast the leader. And that is, I think, where uh, the transformation is. I don't think the idea of employee first, customer second, will stay forever, but the idea that the employee needs to take ownership of the change and needs to be the CEO of the organization has make, made them unlock a, 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 a map in their mind because of which the performance of the company, I think will continue uh, doing much better than it was doing in my tenure. And just to, to finish, I remember when uh, I wrote the the 2013 case, you remember when I visited uh, ACL uh, in Delhi, uh, many people told me about the concept of ID, uh, um, IDpreneurship, you know, the fact that you, you give people the yeah. possibility, and they say the EFCS no, uh, number one, I mean, uh, was managers led, employee, uh, employee embraced, and the reverse is true for, yeah. you know, so that's interesting, um, right. the, you know, employee-led and manager, managers, uh, managers yeah. and brides. Right. So you, you, the model is kind of uh, sustainable. Yeah. Uh, I have one last question on behalf of the youth and then we switch to public questions. Um, what would be the very, very one piece of advice you'd give to us who are uh, like young managers and future managers? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, don't ever ask that question again. <laughs> what are the two pieces? Because, because you must understand, uh, do I know you? No. Am I in your shoes? No. Do I care a shit about what happens to you? No. <laughs> I will give this nice English sentence which will sound very nice, you will write it on a piece of paper. Bullshit. Look at the mirror and ask yourself, what the hell are you going to do with this beautiful person? There is only one of my kind in the world. And the mirror will give you the answer. The mirror will give you the advice. The advice is within you. The answer is within you. Stop fooling yourself by listening to all of us. Listen to us and our stories. Our stories are in our reference, in our time, in our situation, and they will work for us. They may not work for you. Your story and your idea and your innovation and your aspiration has to be unique. Your experiments have to be unique. Look at the mirror and ask yourself, so what have I done new today? What have I tried more today? And that mirror will give you an answer. That's the way I think. Thank you, Vinit. Uh, well, I think it's uh, time now to give the opportunity for the audience to write a few questions or comments. So, uh, who's taking the lead after? Yes, go ahead, please. Start up and speak loudly. Okay. Can you hear me? Sorry? Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nayar. And I wanted to ask a question because when you said that. Uh, when you do many decisions, you will ask yourself, like, uh, 
you know, if I don't do this, will I regret when I'm dying? So I'm asking you that uh, if there's anything you haven't done but you wish you did, if yes, and why you didn't do it. Yeah. <clears throat> Other than get married to the most beautiful actress in Bollywood. <laughs> I, I think there are lots of such things uh, which I wish I had done and I did not do. But I'm learning to be uh, in the moment. Uh, so the way I look at life is in four dimensions. Number one is to try and get financial security. And financial security is different for different people. The second is to get recognition for your intellect. But both of them don't give you happiness. And that is the reason I went into the third role, which is to try and impact lives by giving. And that gives you a significant joy compared to creating wealth and creating recognition for self. So from self, you move to others. But that's also not enough. I think the fourth stage is a stage to be in the moment, to understand that the past is not something which you can undo, and the future is not something you can do. Today is your moment. And the question is, what are you doing today? What are you doing now? As long as you are doing the best you can at this moment, chasing the trains available at this moment, which are impossible to chase, you're OK. So yes, there are many things I wish I had done, but I don't think about them. There are many things I want to do, I don't think about them. I think about only what I can do right now, today. And then just focus on it. And when a train appears, which I can chase, which nobody else is chasing, I will give this up and start chasing the train. When that moment comes, I don't know. But I will know it. There's a very interesting thing which Pele said, uh, I'm sorry, Ronaldo said, uh, which has become a big management mantra for me. A very, very beautiful statement he said. So somebody asked him, how, how did you, when he got the golden boot, how did you score so many goals? And he said something very interesting. He says that when I, when I start running towards the goal, uh, I don't know whether there will be an opportunity to make the goal. However, I know that I will know a split second before anybody knows that there is an opportunity. So I run in the field throughout, waiting for that split second advantage I get over my competition. When it comes, bang, I go in. So that's the mantra of life. You keep running, waiting for that split second, having trained yourself for that split second. When the split second goes, comes, you move, bang. And therefore, I don't worry about the past. I don't worry about the future. I worry about today. And when that train appears, in that split second, I will know, we need, you need to chase that train. I start chasing it. Thank you, sir, for sharing your experiences from life. Uh, I at least got inspired. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, when you were talking about inspired leadership, uh, we all have this conception about leaders being the one who sets the path for the rest of the uh, crowd, right? So, you fall, so that you can follow the path. Uh, do you believe that leaders sh should or can also sometimes take up the role of being a follower themselves? Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, that's what Charles was talking about, the servant leadership idea, and there's a lot which has been written about it. See, I've been CEO now for many, many years, you know, because I became an early CEO thanks to sacking and thanks to starting my own business. And one thing which I know for a fact is that I don't know a lot of stuff. And my inability to think, my inability to solve problems, my inability to do something creates a sense of urgency to get somebody else to do it. And therefore, the only business you can do is to ask you, and I, this is something which I ask everybody, there are two mantras which I employ. First is whenever a new person comes in, I say, what do you want out of this company? And they get surprised in terms of what are you saying. I said, in a year's time, what do you want out of this company? In a two years' time, what do you want out of this company? In the third year, I don't want you to be in this company. 
and they says, you know, people talk about long-term employment, and you are talking about the fact you don't want me. I said, yes. In two years, you need to get what you want from this company and then chase bigger dreams. You should stay if there are no bigger dreams, but otherwise don't stay. So the moment you do that, you have a specificity of action of what you want from that employee and what it is in it for the employee in that specificity. And therefore, you create a, you create a relationship which is a win-win for, for both sides. And I think that has worked much better for me where in that event, I'm a follower of that employee. Because in the end, there are very few things you can do yourself. Now, the only problem is that in their own mind, a lot of CEOs can't see it logically. See, this is the, this is the beauty of leadership, that very few people understand it. And that is the opportunity for you young people. That, as I said, that the most profound statement I'm making today, and you should understand it, is leaders are those who get more per human capital unit of time. The CEOs, many CEOs don't get it. So for you to clean floors, if it helps you do that, you should do that as a leader. If it means serving tea, you should do that as a leader because your, your, your reason of existence is not inspiring people. Your reason for ex or, or leading people or managing people or doing, being the most intelligent, your, your reason for existence to get more out of per unit time. And therefore it means sitting in reception, I did that. For a long period of time, for seven days, I sat in the reception to understand the culture of the company and took telephone calls. So whatever it takes to get the culture of the company, whatever it takes to get more per unit time of human capital, that's what a leader should do. Once you understand it, I think you'll be a great leader. I can ju ju just uh, uh, tell uh, people here the story, the short story you say this morning when you had in Delhi a group of six or seven people uh, willing to buy a product from uh, ACL, but they had visited another company, competing company, and they said, well, we, want pref we prefer the other company. And then you, you, you can finish the story with the, uh, with the lady, uh, you know, at the desk. Yeah, and she was listening to the, to the people waiting in the, in the waiting room and saying, we are not going, in fact, to deal with the HCL. So, so this is a story of a European uh, very large bank who visited HCL, and uh, there were six of them. They came in the way you these are multiple hundred million dollar contracts, and the way these contracts are done is you visit the site, you see the people, uh, you see the work they are doing, and then take a decision whether you want to work with this company or not. The, the six Europeans came in and uh, they came to the reception and they were talking amongst themselves that we, they were very happy with our competitor they saw the day before. And they said, we made up our mind that we're going to go with that company, and therefore we are here wasting our time. So instead of a three-hour presentation, we'll cut it down to one hour and then spend the less balanced two hours shopping. And this conversation was happening in a reception where there was a receptionist sitting, and nobody expected a receptionist to listen to such intelligent conversations. <laughs> and uh, suddenly this lady, she's tall by Indian standards, uh, stood up and said... Uh, in a big booming voice, uh, said, uh, Sirs, uh, can I have a minute of your time? And they look, A, you don't expect an Indian woman to speak in such firm voice. Uh, number two, it didn't sound like a request. It sounded like a command. Uh, so they turned to her and says, yes. And she says that these kids have worked for two days, uh, for the last two days to make this presentation. Yesterday night, they didn't go home. Uh, I cooked breakfast and brought the breakfast for them because they didn't go home. Uh, and they deserve the full three hours to tell you what they can do for you. And if I were you, I would give the order to them because you will never find better sets of people who will work so hard for your success. So they gave us the three hours. We won the contract. And I asked the CEO, I didn't know about the story. I asked the CEO, as to what are those three or four things which made HCL win the multi-million dollar contract at that time. And he last started laughing and he says, there were not five reasons, there was one. And then he named me that receptionist, whose name I didn't even know, and says that was the reason. So, so that's, that's leadership, right? Leadership is about learning from these examples and not knowing which employee will touch what. And that was a $560 million order. 
$560 million order came to us because of one receptionist who found herself empowered to make a difference. And she's a great friend, and I'm still in touch with her. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Naya, for your coming and sharing today. I think everyone tonight is transformed into a sponge to, to absorb your knowledge and experience from you and from your mother. So um, I think you are a very brilliant storyteller, so I'm wondering if you could tell us one more story about what is the biggest difficulty when you are first beginning to conduct the idea of transparency to give the power to the employees instead of leading from above to below, but to leading from below to above. When you are first beginning to conduct this kind of idea, well, what is the biggest difficulty when uh, all the company, everyone is still stuck in the old idea about you know leading from above to below and how did you solve it thank you so uh, uh, so I'll, I'll give you a theoretical framework and then tell you a story uh, theoretical framework is whenever you want to bring a change uh, you need to take three steps number one create dissatisfaction status quo which I hope I've done that you all should walk away from this hall unhappy with what you're doing the second step is to create a vision for tomorrow which is compelling for enough for you to go climb Mount Everest every day. So what is that vision? But the third step is the most important, is the journey from here to there is a series of experiments. It's not announcements, there's no clarity, it's a one step at a time. So it's, right, I, as, as we talked about that noon, noon story, right, it's one step at a time. So one of the things which was the transparency idea was in my mind, and therefore we launched a portal where any employee can open a trouble ticket on the company. And the company will solve it in a limited period of time. So that trouble ticket could be that you have an issue with your bonus, issue with your boss, issue with your work-life balance, any issue. And the organizations will promise to solve that issue in a certain period of time. It could be finance, it could be HR, it could be anything. And the first week or so saw about 30, 40,000 tickets being opened. And 99% of the tickets were sold within you know, a day or whatever service level agreements we had. And I, you know, the side of which you have seen me is this intellectual, but actually I'm a party guy. I really love to party, I, and I party hard. So there were 100 people involved in it. I took 100 on a party, and we were partying hard. Uh, and then we had an open house. That was a mistake. Uh, and I said, OK, so congratulations. You guys have done very well. And before we say good night, is there any question you have? And there's a lady in London who raised her hand and said, uh, Vinit, you're a fool. That's the exact word she said. And my answer was that I have teenagers at home, and I've heard that before. But their reasons are different. Maybe tell me your reason. And I'm glad I said that. And then she says, Vineet, how many people, uh, how many CEOs celebrate the fact that you had 30,000, 40,000 problems? I said, OK. And she says, how many CEOs celebrate with the people who created those problems in the first instance? And that changed me forever. That from being reactive, I became proactive. And therefore, we started rewarding and recognizing and parting on zero ticket days, zero ticket weeks, zero ticket months. Therefore, everybody became proactive. And I think the, the issue is that I face resistance at every corner of my life. But I have never said to anybody, like I'm not saying to you, that I know it all. I launch everything with an experiment, and I understand why God gave me two years and one month. And I use it that way. And therefore, when we launch it as an experiment, we build it together. So the probability of it failing is lesser. And that is the way we have been able to overcome the resistance, because you never have the answers to the resistance. I'll give you a problem today. After doing this boom box in the school, we have covered 7 million children, which will take to, we will go to 20 million children. 
But the question you didn't ask is, how will you teach calculus? How will you teach black hole? How will you teach physics experiment? How will you teach chemistry experiment with an audio box? We don't. We don't know. I don't know. So therefore, the only way to do it is to take a step forward. And therefore, we've taken a step forward and I have committed to a state that we will transform, take this program till class eight and teach science in a frugal fashion. Do I know how? No. But do I know what the first step is? Yes. To convert all physics and chemistry and biology experiments into bamboos, which we have done. And we've come up with a box which costs only $36. In $36, we can do all the experiments. But is that enough? No, because the teachers still can't teach biology, can't teach physics, can't teach maths, and audio box will not help me. What is my answer? I don't know. I keep on talking like I'm talking out here. One of the smart boys or girls will write to me, Vineet, you know, you talked about this problem, I can find a solution. So I throw the problem in the air. And it keeps on swirling, 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 and I get inspired from here or inspired from there, and the solution comes. And that's my approach in life. And with that approach, I think we, we, we end up solving these problems. Okay. Maybe we, yeah, because uh, we need to start to be tired, he's got, uh, flying back tomorrow at five, uh, 7 a.m. to back to India. So the book, you know, this was the book, the original book I found in India in June 2010. Uh, I was finishing uh, an executive program in, um, in a big school in the center of India, in Hyderabad, and I went to the bookstore after the four days of executive training, and I saw this book on, on a pile, you see, and I saw the title, Employees First, Customers Second. I said, who is this foolish guy who has, who has written this book? I, I took one of my participants, I didn't have a rupee with me. I didn't have an Indian money because I just stayed four days in India. So they, he paid for me the $5 you know, cost. I, I read the book in the, in the plane back to Paris and I say, I really need to, to, you know, to see this guy. And one year later, he had the, the French version of the book, you know, employé d'abord, client ensuite. And you have the possibility to buy the book now because you have, a, you, you have the book, you have a stage there. So, it, you know, this book is from 2010, but the story you are telling, you know, is really inspiring. So that's why uh, I do think that there is a, there is a lot of things to learn from, from this book. And I was really shocked, to, uh, and you know, uh, and again, when you, when you meet Vinit, you know, the first time meet Vinit uh, in, a, in a nice dinner, you remember, in Paris, and at the end, he said, uh, I'd like to organize a conference. And four, years, uh, four months later, we organized a conference, a big conference, where uh, you had a standing ovation. You remember the first conference yes, yes. in Paris? So again, you know, inspiring leader. And uh, the Sampak Foundation story is very, very interesting. Now. And for those who, who wish to know more, uh, I talk about these ideas every day. On, so you can follow me on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. Uh, my business is inspiring people, or you can go to sampurkfoundation.org uh, and see what's, what's happening. So, so I'm available not just here, but, but reaching out to many, many people. You have your TEDx video. And there is a TEDx video in which I've explained uh, what Employee First, Customer Second is all about. It's already got a 1.1 million uh, views to it, which shows how important employee centricity is. Uh, so you can see that. There is lots of lots of stuff uh, out in the videos. You don't have to buy the book. There's, there's a lot, lot out there. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks a lot again. Uh, I think you deserve a very big uh, applause, and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you were able to come tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, il a promis de signer les livres de ceux qui les ont. Donc, je vous le dis. Uh, he's going to sign the books if you if you buy the books.
Maybe the same as he did to me. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Yeah.